But, um, Catherine, you'll be pleased because we're a little ahead of time, so you've got a few extra minutes. I'll give you maybe one or two. So, Catherine Tozer is a senior scientist. You gave me a bio and I left it on the table. I'm not going to move, so I'm going to sort of wing it. Um, senior scientist at Ag Research, based in Hamilton, uh, and you've been doing a lot of late, in particular, around pasture resi resilience and persistence. Welcome, Catherine. Isn't it lovely to be able to meet face to face instead of over a computer screen? So uh, I'd really like, before going to the science, just to give credit to the stakeholders involved in this SFF project. It was a really rich um, range of experience with, with industry, with beef and lamb, balance, regional council, plant and food research. So getting together the farmers, rural professionals, regional government and scientists really helped the work that we did to have impact on farm. So in the proceedings, there is a, a write-up about a paddock-based study looking at the impact of deferred grazing on productivity. Well, I'd love to give you a little bit more information today that drew on some other experiments we did in the SFF. So the work was focused in the Upper North Island, in Waikato and Bay, Bay of Plenty, beef and sheep hill country, and mainly perennial ryegrass-based pastures. So in addition to split paddock studies, we also looked at plot scale studies that are a little bit more controlled, at glasshouse studies that were more controlled again so that we could learn something about the mechanisms, and also some farm acts modelling to say, well, what does it mean at farm scale? So firstly, if you're talking about deferred grazing, how are we defining it? Because there's quite a few different ways that people may be thinking about it. In our case, we're simply talking about excluding livestock for the middle of the spring, so about now, once the pasture is starting to get away, and waiting until after seed fall of the desirable pasture species in particular. So traditionally, deferred grazing's kind of been looked down on because the grass in the deferred pasture, particularly if it's dry, can get quite rank. And of course, we know that if you want to improve livestock production, you need to maintain quality. So for that reason, why would you defer and let a paddock get out of control? Well, it's actually looking at the whole farm level in terms of maintaining quality. And for farmers, that is one of the main reasons why they do it, to better match the um, livestock demand with the feed supply. If you're taking, say, 10 to 15% of your grazable area out of grazing, it means that you're no longer getting that spring flush, that instead it's kind of um, matching better, which means that the pasture will be in a more vegetative state, which increases the quality of the pasture, which increases livestock production. We modelled this in Farmax for one property in particular in northwest Waikato, and it led to an 8% increase in the, in the growth margins, and that was purely because of the increase in uh, the pasture quality. A second one is in farmers um, speak, as I was talking about rejuvenating the deferred pastures, and I'll go into the reason for that a little bit more. So yes, of course, there's the reseeding, because if you're locking it up until after the desirable pasture set seed, there's that. But one of the really exciting things we found is one of the key mechanisms was actually increased tillering in the existing desirable pasture plants. In our case, it was perennial ryegrass, but the same principles will apply for other desirable pasture species. And then finally, it took a lot of stress off farmers knowing that they had drought feed there if it was a drought year. Sure, it may not be very high quality, but at least it was feed. So now from some main headlines from a number of these studies. Firstly, in terms of herbage production. So right the way through now, we will compare pasture that was deferred, which is a solid green line, to paddocks that, well, pasture that wasn't deferred, which is a dotted one. So that's both whether we're talking about the plot scale studies the pad or the paddock scale studies. So during the deferred period, the growth rate slows down in the pastures that's deferred in comparison to the ones that not. But after the deferred period, assuming that you graze that rank pasture down, if it's rank, uh, that the light's getting into the base of the pasture, you get a lot more tillering and you get phenomenal growth. And we've measured it different farms, um, different seasons. And it's, it's pretty consistent. And again, I'll show you some information later to explain why that occurs. So if you look at the total amount produced over, say, 12 months, um, 18 months, it's actually similar in the pasture that's been deferred and that that hasn't. You're just changing the time, timing of the feed supply. But remembering again, the main benefit is actually coming from the increased productivity on the rest of the farm. Now for some information on perennial ryegrass tillering. 
and reseeding. And, and if, for those that are interested, actually, we've got a booklet that um, puts or gives you some details on this results and summarise the key lessons. I've got some here, here with me. Uh, so we did this in a summer wet environment and exactly the same experiment in a summer dry environment. And in both cases, we saw similar results. So in the deferred pasture, you had increased, or you had the reseeding, so you had a lot more seedlings in autumn, but you also had a lot more chillers from the existing desirable perennial pasture species. When it was summer wet, and it was conducive for ryegrass growth, the benefits lasted for a lot longer. The graph there on your right, it was not only a summer drought, it was an autumn drought. So in all honesty, Coxfoot would have gone a lot better. Ryegrass struggled. Yes, there was a benefit, but it did not last as long. And um, within a year, it had gone back to the si similar levels as before deferring and in the non-deferred pastures. We looked at ground cover. There are consistently benefits there with the summer wet and the summer dry with deferring. And if you think of the increased tillering, you're going to have greater basal cover of the plants there, so that's part of the reason for the ground cover. There's also litter as well that comes from trampling the rank pasture at the end of the deferred period that is going to provide some ground cover as well. We didn't do any measurements in terms of sediment loss or nutrient loss uh, from the ground, but you, it would be very interesting to kind of measure that and see what sort of impact it had. In terms of nutritive value, because obviously that, that's a massive one. If the pasture is staying green right through summer, the deferred pasture can get rank, and it is important to try and graze that off before it goes to mush, say in autumn, when you get autumn rains. That's what happened in, in this experiment. It had pretty much gone to mush by the time we grazed it. But if it's kind of um, more like a standing hay crop, it, it's still going to be low quality, but it will be better than what, what we had. And in summer dry, well, it doesn't matter if it's deferred or not, it's, it's poor quality pasture and at least it's going to be drought feed for the farmer. In terms of recovery, by late autumn, you, it had recovered, and this is assuming that you had the stock that can graze off that poor quality rank pasture uh, to enable the recovery. Farmers were understandably concerned about facial eczema, given that there was a lot of rank vegetation at the end of the deferred period. F for the two, actually three studies now in Waikato Bay of Plenty, we consistently found that the facial eczema spore count was lower in the pasture that had been deferred than the pasture that hadn't been deferred. We did harvest the samples to ground level, so it's not just that they weren't grazing as low into the sward, it was actually lower uh, spore abundance. We don't know the reason for this, but if you think of a pasture that's constantly being uh, grazed, like rotation grazed, you have a lot of turnover where it's being grazed and it's dying and it's growing and it's dying. The deferred pasture, it's, able to, it's, it's been there for a few months, so the litter quality is quite different to one that's been constantly grazed. There's also changes in the microclimate. One really neat hypothesis to explore, I think, would potentially be the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the two different pasture types along with the microclimate, and just to see if that has any impact on uh, the facial eczema. Now, these, they say a picture paints a thousand words. This is a glasshouse study and it's showing, it, it gave us a bit of an inkling about why we might be seeing the differences that we saw out in the paddocks. So three perennial ryegrass plants per root tube, one metre deep. We simulated normal rotational grazing and we simulated deferred grazing. So with the standard rotational grazing, two and a half leaves, it was pruned, as we were talking about with, um, with Warren's presentation. In the simulated deferred, there was no trimming from mid-spring until about February, I think. And what you can see there is a root mass. So you've got the three stubs at the top, the root mass in the top third, the middle third, and the bottom third of those tubes. And you can see with a simulated deferred grazing treatment, a much greater root mass and root mass at depth. In addition, in this experiment, we also looked at the water-soluble carbohydrate reserves in the leaf tissue. So you can see there with the plant beside the table there, so the top part of the plant, the stubble, which is the next part down, the crown and the roots. And the headlines there is both in terms of the concentration data that's presented, but also the total amount of water soluble carbohydrate. It's two to five times as much in the inverted commas deferred plants in comparison to those that weren't. So come autumn, when you graze it down, you let those lights into the base of the plant, you've, you've basically got a plant on steroids that's just there with all that energy waiting to convert it into 
new chillers. And as well, you've got the reseeding. But as you all know, reseeding can be quite hard when you're, you've got a, a healthy kind of pasture. So that's why we think the regrowth tillering and the new tillers, because of those deep roots there, getting the nutrients, getting the water, and all that energy just waiting to be converted into new tillers. And we think that's why we're seeing the di difference with tillering, and that's why we are seeing the, the uh, massive regrowth that we are. Now, as you know, deferred grazing is nothing new. Farmers were way ahead of the, the ball game decades ago. But um, what was really exciting was to be able to put some numbers on this and also to understand why we're seeing what we're seeing. And in combining the industry and farmer experience, we sort of put together some tips for farmers to know, well, when do you close? When do you open? When might you do it? When might you not do it? And what are some of the pitfalls? So yeah, if anyone's interested after, um, it'd be great to touch base. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine will be up again shortly for a second presentation. But